So, a bombshell coming out of the UK, 1,700 prisoners were released early from prison. And they are released not because of good behavior. The reason for being released is because the prisons are overcrowded, according to the Ministry of Justice. And among them, reportedly, domestic abusers, as well as potentially sex offenders. That has not been confirmed. But the kicker is that some of the victims of the domestic abusers were not informed. So this is big, it is very emotional, and it is complicated. We'll be exploring and asking some questions surrounding this particular quagmire in this episode. But a quick disclaimer, the thoughts, opinion, and perspectives you're going to hear is only for conversation purpose only. End of story. Right. <laughs> Does that reflect the true feelings and true emotions of the contributors today? I mean, that and um, it's possible to hold, you know, contradictory thoughts together at the same time. Many things can be true at once. Um, nothing that is said should be construed as a defense or support of any of the crimes um, um, committed. Fantastic. Exactly. So you also feel free to leave your own thoughts or some thoughts around this topic in the comment section below. Press the like button and also subscribe and share to like-minded people. Let's scatter the yams of this topic together. Let's go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Scatayan Podcast, where we break down the impact of society on individual behavior by asking key questions. As usual, I'm your host, We Know the Boast Toves. And joining me to Scatayan today is Mr. Sheun T. How are you feeling today, Sheun T? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Uh, it's a lucky Friday, but you know, I'm looking forward to the weekend. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to the weekend as well. Big, big football games. But anyways, mm. we'll talk about that in a different podcast run of play. Please check that on YouTube as well. Now, first of all, the, the question that is mind-boggling is why would the government try to, UK government, Labour government, try to um, release 1,700 people, not because of good behavior, simply just to ease overcrowding in the prisons, right? Um, I'm sharing my screen right now. This is an article from the BBC that shows the number of the capacity of prisoners and the number after people were released. So the, the highlighted in red is the prison capacity. So they have lots of people there close to fill to the brim. And the 1,700 people does not even um, reduce it by that much. So Yeah, it's a marginal effect. <laughs> exactly, very marginal effect. So the question that I think I want to ask is, is the government, actually facing a problem or are they creating a bigger one yeah um you know? that's i think this this graph that, you, that they put up right is really it's a really interesting way to think about it right because it's scratching the surface barely um mm -hmm. so you know if you, if you look at it in terms of this graph it seems like it's barely having an impact it's barely scratching the surface mm -hmm. um but, you know, if you think about it in terms of, like, probably the administrative costs, 1,700 people is a lot of people. Like, it's a, it's a lot of people. Yeah. So, you know, the bottom line is that, like, it probably has more of an effect than, you know, the graph here would connote. And I think this serves two purposes, basically. On one hand, you could look at it as um, signaling that the effect is not much. On the other hand, I think members of society should take comfort that most of the bad people in society relatively are still in jail. Um, mm. So 1,700 scratches the surface. Most of the criminals are still in jail, I think is one another way to look at this um, right. chart. So they should look at the silver lining aspect of it. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah fair yeah. enough. But what about like public safety? Because um, even on the news in the, in the UK, there have been like different news organizations that have been trying to track down some of these people to ask them like, how do they feel about it? Even some of those prisoners were saying that this is not a good idea, releasing people without ankle monitor, right? They, the ones that I interviewed were saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to abide by the rules. I'm going to stay in and follow the curfew. Yeah. But they were saying they can't speak for other prisoners that may not even follow the curfew. Apparently, um, there were some 37 people that were released 
that were not supposed to have been released because the criteria mm. had changed. And the police can't even find all of those 37 people because we're not properly mm. monitored. So, yes, there is a marginal reduction in the, the prison size. But what about the cost to the public? Are, are people going to feel safe? You know, that is, that's another conundrum that the government yeah. has kind of created in the society you know that's it's it's it's, it's now a question of it's not a question of leadership right and mm -hmm. i think it depends on how the government is able to communicate how they're able to discuss this this policy because this kind of thing opens them up very they become vulnerable to demagogues like this is the type of thing that somebody can fear monger about significantly mm -hmm. um um and i think before we started i was saying that i hope most of the prisoners are white because <laughs> i think british society will feel better you know, knowing mm -hmm. that like it's not it's not a bunch of, of of black or brown people that are being released in society. That stuff is very vulnerable to demagoguery, as we're seeing in like Springfield, Ohio, with like Trump and Jade Vance and what they're doing to the Haitians. Um, mm -hmm. I think even the riots that happened in the UK uh, a couple of months ago, yeah. right? So I think like but society, especially like with regards to like race and immigration, is already sensitive. So this stuff could further inflame it. Yeah, it is um, sensitive. One yeah. of my most um conservative i guess like points of view or beliefs is that like people shouldn't make perfect like the enemy of good and i would like to hope that uh, in the bare minimum right that originally they look at the eighty thousand prisoners that were there they are able to sort there's a first sorting that happens even if further like due diligence is still required there's mm -hmm. a first sorting that happens to so in all likelihood, surely you're not gonna get a perfect situation of all seventeen hundred people, none of them being recidivists, right? But let's say let's just hope that best case scenario, worst case scenario, ten percent of these seventeen hundred, you know, are recidivists. Um so I think as long as people have in mind the possibility that things wouldn't be perfect, right? Yeah. But like um if if it's not gonna be perfect, then let's hope it's a small percentage of things that go wrong. Yeah, yeah, obviously, um, we, we can only hope that it's majority of people, majority of those um, released prisoners are going to be good. And, but on the other hand, you know, people always think about the worst case scenario and fear the worst, as rightly said, because if someone does not have ankle monitor, how will you know when someone is, you know, committing a crime, is that is their first time doing that crime or a repeated offender? Yeah. We'll never know because we're also trusting people to, to self-police. And, as you mentioned, this is leading, giving room for demagoguery. So how will you trust people to self-police themselves to maintain the law when you know that the reason why they went in the first place, majority of them would have been because they didn't care about the law, they didn't follow the rule of law. So why are we trusting them this time to just, you know, self-govern? And um, like, I mean, what, what, what I'm getting at, what I was getting at was that like, I'm hoping that like there was at least one layer of review. So for example, somebody who's somebody who is doing jail time for selling weed, right? Mm. Which I think you can go to jail for. If, if your crime is that you're selling weed, whatever, I think many people maybe who might be watching or listening know a friend current friend, former friend, so acquaintance, somebody you know that, oh, their source of income is not really, but yeah, yeah, you could, so you could say that, oh, if you're doing one crime, you can do another. Mm. But like, you know, I think most of those of us who I think are adult enough understand that like some, some lines, some people feel more comfortable crossing than others. Let's yeah. say your crime is yao yao, right? Um, mm. is, uh, you went to prison for that really. I think uh, there, there are some crimes that like, you can feel more okay letting people out of, um, yeah. prison what if you commit your you committed your crime in 19 1970 or 1954 and you're now a 70 or 80 year old man who has been in prison all your life basically you know yeah so i, I think like you know if you think about it's really like hopefully there mm -hmm. was an initial yeah um, the initial thing that was yeah. done to at least like that's what i'm saying the likelihood of anything else spilling out would be would be less yeah. right so now let's let's kind of move the conversation a bit more some a bit away from the actual situation to something that is a bit more moral because it's Katayan, we all try to look at the impact of socialization and all of that on behavior. So the, the, the moral question that I have is, does everyone deserve a second chance? If they've committed, using the, this crime scenario, people that have committed crime, does all, do all criminals deserve a second chance? Or should we second guess <laughs> some of the released or convicted people. What, what what do you think about this? I mean, I, I feel like that should be a no brainer, right? Everyone everyone deserves. Let me never say a second chance. Everybody deserves due process, 
Um, so everybody deserves to have their case heard and assessed and to go through the process of the, the justice system. Um, I think where we often fall into the trap is, again, demagoguery, right? And I think part of why, for example, in this story, part of why people went straight for oh, what's happened to the sex offenders, what's happened to the domestic abusers, is because those things are salacious. And mm-hmm. for me, it's, it's more important that like everybody gets a due process, right? Or everybody gets to be treated fairly, not just based on whatever accusation or whatever um, um, name that, like what you call it now, the crime is called, mm-hmm. but... Not not necessarily second chance because maybe a crime can be so heinous that you deserve to spend the rest of your life in jail, um, mm-hmm. and there's no second chance for you in mm-hmm. regular society. But you should get due process. Yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of I kind of agree with that to a certain percentage, but at the same time, um, uh, I would like to think that a lot of people will say that if you've done any kind of crime that has physically harmed people, so like domestic abuse, self. Um, sex offense then i don't know if second chances in terms of coming back to the real society i don't know how much that can really um how much chance you should be given Mm. because it's about also the mental health of the of the victim as well because imagine they are they've had solace and comfort that okay the person who actually hurt me is now in prison only for them to hear that they're the they're probably out and about in the streets. Now the people don't no longer feel safe. Their mental health is like going down the drain and, and things like that. So yes, while people might deserve second chances, but I would say maybe they should be you should allow for no, don't give people second chances, but don't give third and fourth chances. Is, is what I'm going to say. Like second chances, fair enough. Give give what people one strike and then maybe not a second or third strike, especially if they are repeat offenders and things like that, because of the the physical, emotional, and psychological aspects of of victims of that particular well, crime. I mean, I, I think before I before I say what I'm about to say, I'll just refer people to the initial. Um, to the initial comment that we made, the initial disclaimer that we made, mm-hmm. um, that you know, you should be able to hold complex thoughts in your head at the same time. Yes. Um, now that being said, I, I don't think it should be up to the victims to determine what justice is. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I as cold as whatever as that sounds, I think there's a, there's a place for consoling the victim. There's a place for feeling bad for the victim. There's a place for you know, um, um, commiserating with the victim. All of that, mm-hmm. right? But I just don't think justice should be in the hands of the victims because victims are biased by definition. Um, I think a law has to be a law regardless mm-hmm. of the feelings of the person um, um, yeah. that are involved and are impacted. It makes it complicated politically, right? It presents a political problem for the people that are involved. Um, but, you know, that just, that just, comes, with, that just comes with the price of, of leadership. Um, but yeah, you cannot determine what the outcome should be based on on how a victim is feeling. Right. But the, on the flip side of that, the flip side to that coin is, I think you kind of have to simply because the reason why justice is being sought or justice justice is being um, being meted out in the first place because someone has done wrong to one person. The person did not actually do wrong to the entire society, even though that crime or that particular act might be seen as affecting the entire society. They actually did wrong to one person or a group of persons. So since the, the justice is being served because of one person or a group of person, I think it still kind of implies that you are, the victims kind of determine justice. No, no. I mean the, the entire the entire premise of our society. I know you don't like governments, right? But one mm-hmm. one of the premises of of the modern societal arrangement that we have is that we outsource the justice seeking. We have outsourced it to a third party. We have outsourced our justice seeking to a third party, to to the police or to the law enforcement or whatever. So it's no longer it's no longer in our hands, right? If somebody mm. does something wrong to you, it's no longer up to you to go to their house and, and exact vengeance, um, because that in itself is a crime. Um, so you take it to their property authorities, and they, they don't be that honest. is where <laughs> 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 no, no, it's true now, like because an, an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. Um, mm. Um, so th- these are questions that we, we debated and we answered a long time ago, like uh, around like how best to govern a society. And mm. now we're just trying to iron out the edges. basically. All right. Fair enough. And, um, so with this thing that's happened right now, like how do people trust the government system, like the, the justice system? Because 
you know, the reason people when tags are not ready, not being able to locate everyone. Some people are feeling like having mental health challenges because they don't know if they are offenders are among those that are the ones that are released because you can't mm. actually just go and look for the name. Like, how can people trust the gov- the, the justice system and, and feel safe when they can't actually trust that the government is looking out for them and they're only looking out for their pocket because from the on the other side of it, yes, they're releasing overcrowding, but as the point I tried to make earlier, that 1700 is a lot of money, it's a lot of, of things like that. I don't know if you saw that TikTok video that of that about that guy that always asks, is it concerning? Um, <laughs> and he asked the question, um, prisoners have food and water from the government, but homeless people rarely do. So are, are we trusting the government, the, the government system to actually protect us or are they just looking out for the, the social cost of and, and, and things like that? I mean, I think that that ship has sailed now, right? In terms of like like trust for government institutions, that ship has already sailed. Um, there's very low trust. I think across the board, like Western society, like a key feature of the, the political moment that we're in with like Boris Johnson and everything, it's lack of trust. People don't trust the government. People don't trust the institutions that are supposed to, you know, govern our society. So it is an, a whole mass epistemological failure, right? So whether it's COVID, whether it's vaccines, nobody knows what is true or what's not or anything. Like nobody trusts anything that they read or they hear. So yeah, that's yeah. Um I think at this point in time, right? And and I'm not I'm not exactly convinced that. Um, more disclosure is the right way because there are a lot of people who think they want the government to tell them to just tell us what is happening, just tell us what is happening, and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if that is necessarily, you know, um, um, the way to go um, necessarily because generally, like, there's a a bad faith, how I put it now, approach that is baked in already into the situation because, like I said, people already don't trust. Like off the bat, don't trust the government or don't trust like any of their governments. So yeah, this isn't going to help. I think the only thing that can the only thing that can that the government can do right now mm-hmm. is to up the administrative like like show that you're on top of all the stuff. So anybody that did not put ankle monitor on, go and put an ankle monitor. Yeah, um, obviously, they would have to do that at some point. Look, yeah. Yeah. Things like a let, let there be a database where somebody can go and look if if you if you think if you are if you want to know if your own abuser or offender was one of them, you should be able to quickly find out that information. So like they should address the concerns of those people who they think could be most vulnerable. Um, mm. I think would be the way to at least try and marginally improve trust. Um, okay, uh, I will. I would like to slowly round up this particular episode, but from our conversation right now, it's it has led now to this usual discussion prisons is it meant to be just for punishment or is it for rehabilitation because we can't expect the government to be both a, a warden at the same time a psychiatrist or a psychologist to try to rehabilitate people so prisons what what should, what should it be for you know and then a, a follow-up question as well can people who have committed like domestic abuse like crimes be domestic violence be rehabilitated, you know, in prison. Can they be rehabilitated in prison? In prison, yes. Yeah, of course now. Anybody can be re- anybody can be rehabilitated now anyway. Mm. And and it's, it's it's prison for punishment or for rehabilitation. For me I think it's it should be for punishment. And that's all it, it is. Because I don't think that the people that are working in prisons actually have the facilities and are trained to be rehabilitators so you know i mean that's that's the objective in in theory prison serves two primary purposes to remove offenders and deviants from larger society and to a lesser second order function to Mm -hmm. rehabilitate them and to get them you know back in society basically um yeah um so yeah i think i think prison the, the problem the problem right is for example, in somewhere like the US, where it's a for-profit venture, essentially. So, so the 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 purpose basically prison, because we're human beings, right? Prison has moved on from, I guess, what you would call the theoretical function, like in mm-hmm. theory, how the Romans might or Greeks might have envisioned something like a prison. It has moved from that to being just like a class 
you know, a, it's now intersected with, with class and race and all these kind of things, right? Where it mm-hmm. barely serves the purpose that it's supposed to. And there are lots of good people in prison and lots of bad people who money and power protects. Right. Um, but yeah, in theory, prison should be able to rehabilitate, rehabilitate somebody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, for, for this one, I don't know if I can really answer that question, really, because I've not really read too much about the UK prisons. I know that in some parts of America, they call their prison Department of Corrections. I don't know if they're actually correcting anything. Um, but yeah, I'll leave that to you, the audience. What do you think it should be? Is it should be for, should prisons be for rehabilitation? Or should be just for serving punishment. Like I said, I think it should be for serving punishment. Um, Wait, what, what should it? What should it be for? What should it be for? Yes, uh, it, it can't just be for serving punishment now. No, right? only serving punishment. Well, like are they are they hiring psychologists and and shrink and do mm-hmm. they have like programs a ten step. 10 year plan programs to rehabilitate these no, guys but, and bring no, them like, back. Think of, think, of all the, think of all the ways that like somebody could end up in prison. On the spectrum of things you could do to get, go to prison, you could be mm-hmm. Osama Bin Laden, for example, mm-hmm. or you could be Michael Schofield, right? You could be somebody who, I mean, in his, his case, he deliberately went to prison to go and try and rescue his brother. Yeah, but that's right? a but part, <laughs> but part of what the Part of what the show explored, like where people who, for anybody from financial crime, to mm-hmm. somebody whose sister was hungry, so he stole a loaf of bread. To mm-hmm. somebody who was unlucky and encountered a racist policeman, you mm-hmm. know, I, I think the 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 conceit of reform in prison, the fundamental conceit, is that human beings are are all we're all human, like and part of our humanity comes with a vulnerability. We are all mm-hmm. pro- we have we all have a propensity to commit crime. Yes, we, and it's there's nobody who can say by nature of the constitution. It's not possible. I think we all yeah. make choices, our economic... So, ideally, prisons should serve as both punishment and an opportunity for um, for rehabilitation. Well, based on those examples that you gave, like someone that went to go and steal bread to feed their family, how do you rehabilitate that person? You've already ruined their life by making them a convict. So, it's really, no, it's really so, a punishment because when they come no, back... Yeah, exactly. Out, so, 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 the, the, rea- the rehabilitation... Come by rehabilitation. I think what, what what it means is not letting prison be a place that is just how I put it now. Um, still providing an opportunity to educate, to inform, so that like your time there can be spent productively. Providing an avenue to spend the time in prison productively, I think, is where the rehabilitation comes in. So even if you're unlucky and you went to jail because you stole tomato, at least in prison, you know, maybe you can go to school. Maybe you can learn a trade, maybe something, so that when you come out, you know, because unless you plan on locking people up for life, mm-hmm. th- there has to be a plan to reintegrate them into society. Mm-hmm. And it, it's already expensive. Like prisons are notoriously expensive to maintain, which is why I think in America they um, outsource it to the private sector, yeah. which is why in the UK they're trying to reduce the the you know the the capacity. In there, yeah. yeah, about the people in prison. Yeah, but it's expensive to maintain. So you have to have yeah. a plan as a society for what happens if you let somebody back in. Um mm-hmm. if if you keep somebody in the jungle and you're not letting them back in, you're gonna create even more problems because the people you're releasing are not well adjusted. They don't have any skills. They they are so they're likely to commit crimes and go back. So like there has to be some rehabilitation, you know, avenue basically for, for prisoners. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, fair enough. I think what I understood from that is rehabilitation back into society. But I'm thinking rehabilitation in terms of reforming their 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 their, their personality and, and it's you know, their character. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. No, no it's, it's part of it now because fundamentally the, the whole idea of prison is that most of us, most of normal people mm-hmm. are able to live constrained within the um, de facto rules of society. We're we're able to be constrained by norms and just unsaid rules of behavior. So, oh, don't go around naked. Don't steal Mm -hmm. from somebody. Don't do all the kind of things. We're able to be constrained by just the de facto rule. But some people need that extra regimentation Mm -hmm. that comes with with prison, right? So, oh, your own is too much. Like, you are are clearly special. So, okay, Mm -hmm. you go and be locked up go on a routine, wake up 5 a.m. Because I think a prison, your every movement is like... It's monitored. And like, what... That's part of the idea is that is some people need to be put under like serious regimentation so that they so that they can be become well-adjusted or better adjusted, let me see. Right. Um, human maybe maybe the, the military should be the ones be, you know, did the rehabilitation then instead of just regular people that are trained. But that's a Wait, conversation. Maybe, maybe should be who's doing the rehabilitation? 
the the military because I think they they have more <laughs> more experience and actually you know disciplining people into becoming and shaping people into becoming a particular a particular well, way not like for like the way for last song zombie but anyways um, like I said it's going to be a conversation for another day I like to round up with the, some would you rather questions as usual so I'm just going to do a few um, so would you rather release would you rather be able to release prisoners early without ankle tags to ease overcrowding or to keep them in prisons despite the potential safety risk overcrowding might cause? Would I rather? I be think, able, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a progressive on this stuff. I think, mm-hmm. I think it's okay to release. I, I, I definitely am willing to consider the possibility that out of that 80,000, there's at least 1,700 of them that were unjustly or unfortunately or because of racist British policemen or whatever. I think that that's, that's a small enough percentage to, you know, rough on and say, okay, these people are likely to have been unjustly in prison. So I'm fine with it, yeah. All right. I, to be fair, I think I'll, I'll support that as well. Um, yeah, ease of a crowding because... Yeah, again, for me, it depends on the kind of prison as well. I think I'm going to put a caveat. Usually, I don't like caveat. I'll put a caveat. Depending on the kind of prison, it's like maximum security where, you know, it's like serial killers, serial rapists. The hardest of hard guys. Exactly. Yeah. Of a crowd. I don't care about the risks. But if it's just like people that just want to go sell weed or, you know, um, people that were financial crime, stuff like that, that maybe release release their belly. Um, That'll be it. Mm. Um, So... Next one is, would you rather have the power to decide who gets early release or have to interview each prisoner personally before deciding? Wait, I don't understand. Like, how would I, would how have would I determine power? who gets early release? Would you rather have the power to decide who gets early release? So you have the power to decide who is going to be released early or would you rather have the power to interview each prisoner personally before other people release them? Would I have the power to... Would I rather... I think I guess I would rather rely on third party interviews and have decision making power. Um, yeah, I think I want to have the power to decide who get released. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some people that I don't think should be coming back out, but um Yeah, let somebody decide. else interview or I mean what if I interview somebody who I feel strongly about, you know, deserves freedom and then the person mm. who wants to decide who has to decide says no. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. One one for fun. One for fun. Would you rather um, do time in a prison design, designed by IKEA? So you build your own prison cell by yourself or in a prison that was designed by a group of Amazonians? Amazonians. As in Amazon website? No, Amazon people live in the Amazon forest. In the Amazon, Amazon forest. forest? Yes. Uh, IKEA now. Amazon Forest is, is death now. There's no prison. That one is the only one when I have the key in the jungle, drink your blood or something. <laughs> I've not seen Apocalypto. That's, I've that's, seen Apocalypto. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Amazon Forest though. It's right. So looking ahead, one thing is clear. Decisions like this don't just affect people behind bars. They affect everyone in society. So where do we draw the line between compassion and caution? Between second chances and public safety? Right, you let us know. This has been Scatterian Podcast. Until the next time, stay curious, stay safe, keep asking questions, question everything. Use your brain. Thank don't you, go to prison. For joining us. Say that again. Say don't go to prison. Please don't go to prison and stay safe, okay? See you later. SCFO.